On Friday, July 6th, the Nationals take on the Marlins, and the first 25,000 fans take home a Bryce Harper patriotic bobblehead presented by SAIC. Get your tickets at nationals.com. Radio WRNR Studios. It's time for Eastern Panhandle Talk with Rob Mario and David Welch. Good morning. Happy Friday, everyone. Welcome into the program. I am David Welch, the Dave part of Eastern Panhandle Talk with Rob and Dave. Rob is out today, and Matt Miller was kind enough to come in at 6 o'clock this morning and fill in for Rob from 6 to 8 and now take his place on the show. Welcome in, Matt. I don't know that I would say kind enough. <laughs> it's just thought I'd put a good spin on it. It's just my job. And as we noted yesterday, uh, for those of you who are morning listeners and have not uh, ever tuned in to the 5 o'clock Miller Time show, you're missing something. So please try and do that. What's coming up on the program uh, at 5 o'clock today, Matty? We'll have Dave Johnson, voice of the Washington Wizards, who will join us for at least a 15-minute segment nice. as we talk about some of the off-season moves they've made. Very nice, yeah. Ask him about uh, how he feels about my Lakers getting uh, LeBron James. <laughs> I, I, can, I continue to be conflicted by that, by the way, because I am not a LeBron James fan. I'm not really sure I can tell you exactly why. I'm just not. But I am uh, from, I think, my birth, a Laker fan, and uh, it's been a long drought for Laker fans the last five years. That's it. So anything that can turn it around is a good thing. Well, you know, you figure you, get, you, you put LeBron on that team with Alonzo Ball and the others that they have. I mean, what a high-profile team. And you're going to need that kind of team out there for the next, what, seven years or so so just to compete in the division with the Warriors. Yes. Yeah, obviously, because that, that, I think they call that a dynasty. Why has basketball moved west as opposed to east? I have no clue. <laughs> I, I, you know what I think it might be is that a lot of these players, see, these superstar players, are drawn to the glamour, the glitz, the weather, and all of that of San Francisco and Los Angeles. Is that a reason? I don't know. I mean, if you, had the, if you had the choice and all the money in the world, as NBA players do, and you could play, in, play and live in Cleveland or Los Angeles, you might pick Los Angeles. Our producer, Sherry, says the weather. The LOL. weather. There you go. We're saying the same thing. Our sponsors on today's uh, program, uh, Miller's uh, Chrysler. Uh, Dodge Jeep Ram on Route 9 east of Martinsburg, home of the Lifetime Powertrain Warranty. And our longtime sponsors, Farmers and Mechanics Insurance Companies, when it comes to your home, auto, farm, or business, we're trusted, reliable, and experienced. Today, of course, is the uh, Friday show where we bring in the uh, political crew uh, at 8.30. You'll want to tune into that for sure today. Good crew, Jason Barrett. Uh, Mike Folk, Delegate Mike Folk, and Sammy Brown all in the studio at one time. So I suspect we're going to have, let's call it a robust discussion about a lot of things. Also joining us at the 8.30 hour by telephone, uh, Council Member, Berkeley Council Member Doug Copenhaver will be talking right off the bat, Matt, about the new uh, fire fee uh, that is going to be uh, coming in. And we're going to have some professional firefighters, I guess, uh, by a 3-2 to two vote. The County Council uh, voted that through yesterday, and so fire fees are going to go up, I think, from $35 to $70, if I have that uh, correct. We'll find out the numbers. And I think there are some people around the table who might not agree with the councilman on that. So, again, uh, always a place we think here on Eastern Panhandle Talk where we provide the opportunity for, um, let's call it civil debate. That seems to be the word these days. And speaking of civil, the ever so always civil, the Honorable Senator Patricia Rucker on the line uh, with us on the uh, Berkeley and Jefferson County Medical Center, WVU Medicine Talk Line. Senator Rucker, it's so nice to have you into the program. It has been a while. Yes, it has. Thank you very much for inviting me. You have a busy life. Uh, you're, you're a state senator, which I'm sure keeps you very busy, especially these days, it seems. And then you are also a full-time mom at home, and God only knows what else you've got going on. <laughs> I also try to volunteer and help out in the community. So, yes, I am very busy. Thank you. The, the the obvious reason that we would like to talk to you, of course, we could, we'll take this conversation anywhere you would like to go with it, but uh, we've been covering this, as all media outlets have been covering this, 
uh, now for the, at least the last two to three weeks, and that is the impending, possible, maybe, probable, however you spin that, uh, impeachment of the Chief Justice, now former Chief Justice Alan Loffrey. And what makes it so interesting for you, I would imagine, is that you are also on the Senate Judiciary Committee. As you watch the uh, debate, if you will, the process going on over with your uh, brothers and sisters on the House side, what are your thoughts, uh, realizing that in a very short period of time, you may be sitting as a member of the jury deciding whether or not to convict Alan Loffrey and remove him from office? Well, I, I will tell you honestly, um, because I am going to probably, maybe, be uh, a jurist, I really can't comment, you know, on my opinion of what I think. I'm trying to... Um, just keep an open mind and praying that the process is fair and just and, you know, it's a very serious thing uh, to consider impeaching any official, especially elected official. So I certainly hope that the process is a fair and just one. You know, I've asked all of the elected officials this on both the Senate and the House side, and I'll put this question to you as well. This is not a, a situation in which one would approach with glee i mean this is a sad situation do you feel the weight on your shoulders possibly uh when you consider the possibility of being in that position yes i definitely do that's a tough one i would imagine very tough when you look at and maybe i'll ask this of you as a private citizen and not even a senator and remove that part, uh, that disclaimer that you provided about wanting to not comment on, on specifics, but when you look at the list of indictments that were handed down and announced a few weeks ago by the U.S. Attorney in Charleston, and you look at some of the things that you might be aware of, the charges, the allegations that have been made you know, public, and those things that we are all aware of, is there, are there any of them that jump out at you as particularly egregious? No, and I really can't comment on that. I really can't. I will tell you that it is something that um, I was in league with my fellow senators in agreement to put the constitutional amendment that we are going to all, as citizens, be voting on in November to let the legislature have oversight over the judicial budget. And I think that that's a very important amendment that needs to pass. We need to put some check and balances into this. And we can see clearly, you know, that when you don't have that check and balance, it's a corruptible influence, you know? If I am, I know that you ran when you first ran for office and then when you ran again for the state senate, as many of your colleagues who were elected during that sort of same time period, you ran on a platform of wanting to get rid of waste, fraud, and abuse. We heard that over and over as a, as a, right. as a campaign theme. And yet voters now, I think, many voters are, as they approach, we approach the November elections, are looking at Charleston and saying, man, there's, there's something wrong down there. You've got Supreme Court justices that are possibly violating, you know, the law, certainly acting in, in ways that are unethical, if not illegal. You've got rental space that is being uh, paid out for no tenants of million dollars going to the one DHHR space in Charleston. We have $150 million of federal money that is not getting to the victims of the flood and helping them to rebuild their homes. And so I do think, this is my own opine here, you've got a, a lot of voters saying there's something wrong in Charleston. Do you think they're looking at it and saying that, uh, boy, those Republicans were right, they had the right message, uh, they're trying to clean things up, or are they looking at it and saying, you know, they've been there for four years and they haven't done anything yet? How do you think voters are, are, are pro approaching some of these issues of state government just not working very well? Well, I can't speak for, you know, every voter or even a majority of voters, but I can tell you that there is a lot of voters who do see that we are trying to clean things up, who do recognize that, you know, when the Republicans inherited and before, you know, I, even I got elected, when the Republicans inherited this responsibility and, and were put in the majority, West Virginia was an absolute mess. We were behind. We were last in everything. We had... Um, 
you know, the, the most jobs lost in manufacturing, the most uh, people addicted to opioids, all of this negative things that we took on and we have been one by one just hitting the reforms, you know, going for legal reforms, going for educational reforms, going for um, drug reform, passing, you know, bills that gave more local control and took some of that power out of Charleston and trying to control the spending. And we are seeing now the results of that. It is pretty hard to argue with the numbers. I mean, they just reported the, uh, you know, end of the year revenue numbers and we're in the positive again, second year in a row. And I cannot emphasize how I'm glad to be part of a team that is making really tough decisions, but putting West Virginia on the right track and in the right direction. One of the uh, big criticisms that is going around the state these days by a number of leaders in both parties is the performance and the job performance, if you will, of the chief executive of West Virginia, our governor, Jim Justice. Um, can you offer me your thoughts in terms of what kind of job you think he's doing, and is it legitimate to be criticizing him for not showing up at the office uh, very often? Well, it is a constitutional part of his job. I definitely wish that he would be. Um, and it's not because I, you know, say that it's he's the greatest person to be working with, but I will tell you that um, it definitely, people elected him, and they elected him to be there. And so I do believe he should be there. And be, especially when we see that there's all of these problems and that there are agencies that are not doing their job, the way that the West Virginia, you know, puts the balance of power, they do give the chief executive almost all the power to oversee all of these bureaucracies. And we can see with DHHR, with DOH, with um, State Board of Education that, you know, we can't just let them go without oversight. I'm glad that the auditor found, you know, oh my goodness, that empty building. I was in that committee and it just just completely blew my mind that that could go for so long before it got caught. But these are the kind of things that we should be having oversight over. And I'm not saying the governor would have immediately seen that, but he needs to know that obviously there's something wrong. And unless we change the constitutional powers, which I'm actually in favor of, it's his job to make certain that these audits are going on, that every single agency is being responsible. And as a businessman, I mean, he must know that you cannot be wasting money like this. You cannot be letting people just um, be callous about the money that is being spent. And one of the things that I ran on, as you said, was less government spending, limiting the government to what its, you know, its job is. And one of the reasons for why I felt that is because Government will waste. It just, it looks for ways to spend the money that it's given. Um, unfortunately, they don't have the attitude of being careful with every single dollar. Uh, I believe that the new secretary of the HHR and the other leaders that Justice um, has put on are pretty good, and they're trying to do their job well. But that doesn't mean you can just rest on your haunches and you know, just let it happen. You have to be actively there doing your job and overseeing. We uh, have talked a couple of times lately with Wood County Republican Chairman Rod Cornelius, who is, uh, as you probably know, leading an effort, trying to lead an effort statewide that would result in the impeachment of Governor Jim Justice. Do you think it's time to move in that direction? Have his, has his job performance and his, let's say, uh, failure to take this job uh, as a full-time job, his failure to live in the mansion, um, his uh, mismanagement, apparently, of the RISE program, going back to the fact that we've got this federal, these federal dollars that aren't getting to where they need to be. Could you see yourself possibly part of a movement that uh, would call for the impeachment or even the resignation? of Jim Justice? Well, like we mentioned before, if there is any articles of impeachment, I would be in the position of being a jurist. So I really can't comment. I really... So you can't even take a, you can't take a position on even, you don't feel comfortable taking a position on, on the possibility of any kind of impeachment? 
Well, if I did, I would probably have to, you know, recluse myself from then sitting as a juror. So I just want to take my job seriously. And I do believe that, you know, if there is ground for impeachment, it will become obvious and it will be done the right way. Uh, one of the issues that we have with what's going on now is that this is such a vague part of the law and we don't want to take away somebody's um, right to an impartial jury and also to be, you know, have the proof made available. I, I am always concerned about, um, you know, people who are doing it as a political instead of a ethical, um, you know, movement. Um, I don't want to be going after folks who are Democrat or Republican because they're Democrat or Republican. Yeah, and that's the interesting thing about these impeachment uh, issues, both with the Supreme Court and now, you know, the, this movement with the governor. It doesn't seem to have a partisan nature to it. You've got members in both parties that are on both sides of the issue, it seems. And so this is, uh, hopefully it stays not partisan. I would hope that, you would hope that. Um, let's talk for a minute about, because we're on the topic of government not working in, in many cases, and there is no more glaring example of it. This will be the third time I've brought this up now, so let's dive into it a little bit. And that is the, the tragedy of the, the RISE program that has resulted in very little of the federal dollars getting to where they need to be. This is a colossal failure of the state bureaucracy as I see it. What can the legislature do to to fix this and correct it and to make sure that these dollars get to where they need to go? You know, I'm not on that particular committee and I don't know in detail what our authority could be. This is, again, you know, just a clear example how the way that West Virginia is structured with giving so much power to the governor and to the um, agencies you know, they're supposed to be taking this job and doing their part, and they just report to the legislature their progress. Well, we, in the last interims, it was very clear. Not only are they not willing to report honestly on their progress with having, you know, folks who were supposed to be there not even show up, but, um, you know, it's clear that that's not enough. We really have to allow elected officials to have more ability to be able to direct things. Um, as far as I know, there was no particular bill that was not ignored or not done the right way. This is a question of not following through. So you have an agency that was supposed to be on, on top of it who did not do it. And this is where you can see that this top-down way of government just does not work efficiently. And in addition to... You know, the Commerce Secretary, you know, I do believe that the governor should take more responsibility over this crisis. And what's really tragic and I think gets lost is the fact that there are folks in West Virginia who still do not have a permanent home. I, the amount of stress that that causes on a family, on children, um, on a, you know, community services which are trying to help these people, I mean, that's just really inexcusable. We're talking with State Senator Patricia Rucker, uh, the 16th District, representing uh, Jefferson and uh, Berkeley County, uh, kind of going around. Matt, did you have a question here? Where is this $150 million? Is it in a particular fund somewhere? I, I hear the amount and hear that it has not been distributed, but I don't know that I've ever really heard what the situation is with that money. Are you asking if it's in a lockbox somewhere? I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, again, this is where I'm in a position of not being able to answer in details. I'm not on that committee, so I don't get all of the reports as to who was supposed to do what. And actually, I've been waiting. All of the committees get put online so folks can watch it, and they have yet to put all the last interims up so that uh, citizens and senators like myself can actually watch what happened and what was actually said. But I do know that, I mean, I have complete confidence that committee is going to get to the bottom of it. Um, I know that they're planning on sub some of the folks who did not show up, and they are definitely going to um, have hearings on what occurred. So I, I have faith in the process and the fact that my fellow elected representatives 
Uh, Senator Blair, for example, is on that committee. Senator Gonch is on that committee. And I know that they will they will get this answered for us. Before we let you go, I would be remiss if I did not ask you, and first of all, sort of open this up with kind of uh, maybe tongue-in-cheek humor, but uh, it's always a happy year when you don't have to run for re-election, right? So uh, you, you, you get a break from that. But in this year where you're not running for re-election because you have a four-year term, uh, how do you plan to keep yourself busy during the fall elections? Will you be helping other candidates around the eastern panhandle or in the state at all? I appreciate you asking that. Actually, yes, I'm, I'm definitely going to have a hand in helping fellow candidates. And I am happy that I'm not running for re-election. <laughs> but I, I am very concerned about our education. And I am definitely not resting on my laurels. Because you can, we have made progress when it comes to educational reform, but not nearly as much as really I feel it's necessary. We saw with this last year, you know, the crisis that occurred because teachers felt that they were undervalued and not appreciated. And I agree. I believe they're not appreciated and they're undervalued. I believe there is still way too much bureaucracy when it comes to education, way too much control. We need to empower our actual teachers that are in the classroom, and we need a revamping of the way we do education in West Virginia. I push for a constitutional amendment that didn't make it through the process last year, but I will continue to push for that because just like the judicial branch was independent and there was not oversight, all they had to do was request the money and we had to give it to them. When it comes to the State Board of Education in West Virginia and the way the Constitution is written, they feel they make all the policies, and yes, they have to report back to us, but they don't really have to follow through with any recommendations we make. They're considered recommendations and recommendations only. That is not acceptable, because when parents are unhappy, who do they call? The folks they elected. They don't call the State Board of Education superintendent. Senator Rucker, we're going to let that be the last word because we have to take a hard break at 830. Oh, but thank you okay. so much for starting your Friday with us and uh, have a great weekend. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Okay. Senator Patricia Rucker, courtesy of the Berkeley and Jefferson County Medical Center, WV Medicine Talk Line. We're going to go to a short break. We'll be back with more Eastern Panhandle Talk with Rob and Dave. CBS News Special Report. The June Jobs Report has just come out. CBS News Business Analyst Jill Schlesinger, how'd we do? Well, we did slightly better than expected. We had 213,000 jobs that were created during the month of June. So we're averaging more than 200,000 jobs a month. We got positive revisions. The unemployment rate, it went up to 4%. Don't freak out about that. That is because more people entered the labor market. So top line, good report. Uh, wages have been the Achilles heel in this economic recovery. Any movement there, Jill? Unfortunately, still pretty static because we know that average hourly earnings, they increased by 2.7% from a year ago. We're kind of stuck in this range, 2.5 to 2.7 or 8%. We really need to get to 3% so that consumers can go out and spend freely in the economy, Deb. CBS News Business Analyst Jill Schlesinger, CBS News Special. Now your local news from Talk Radio WRNR. It passed by the thinnest of margins, but as a result of yesterday's Berkeley County Council vote, in a little over a month, county residents will be paying fire fees that are double what they are now. The extra money will pay for two professional firefighters at every main volunteer station and three substations. In addition, starting August 12th, the Fire Service Board will be able to bill property owners who are delinquent in paying their fire fees $1,000 for calls. The only things that could stop all this from happening are legal actions or voter petitions. County Fire Service Board Chairman Hunter Wilson previously told the council that the number of calls for service that went unanswered due to understaffed departments went from just over 20 in 2007 to more than 1,200 last year. There'll be nighttime lane closures on Interstate 81 in the Martinsburg area starting tonight. They'll be performing shoulder work and crack sealing between milepost 12 and 21. I'm Adam Boardman. Talk Radio WRNR News. Now, with your local forecast, weatherman Bob Kukin. Keeping an eye on weather radar this morning, showers and thunderstorms in the forecast. With the approach of the cool front that we've been watching off to the west and the northwest over the last couple of days, it'll be coming on through here during the day, breaking the back of the heat wave that's been with us here now for a week and looking at some much more seasonally mild temperatures in here for the weekend before we start to heat up once again early next week. 
Today's rain probably confined to the first half of the day. The showers tapering off, some sunshine returning by mid-afternoon. In the meanwhile, there could be some heavy downpours this morning. Temperatures near 84 degrees for our high. Fair skies tonight, the low 60. I'm Bob Kukin, Talk Radio, WRNR. Hello, this is Delegate Mike Folk, candidate for West Virginia Senate District 16. I want to extend my personal congratulations to all the Little League All-Stars this summer. As a former three-sport athlete and Shepherd football player, I understand the importance of discipline, hard work, and perseverance, something our All-Stars have in common. As you continue your journey through this summer and your life, remember this quote from Hall of Famer Jerry Rice, who said, Today I will do what others won't, so tomorrow I can accomplish what others can't. Best of luck and have a great tournament. The 28th season of the Contemporary American Theater Festival returns to Shepherd University July 6th through the 29th. A chance to see six bold new plays, including A Late Morning in America with Ronald Reagan. This world premiere from award-winning playwright Michael Weller takes us to a casual sit-down with the former president for recollections that only the First Lady might know. For a full schedule and more information, go to catf.org. Come out Friday, July 13th and support the Spring Mills football program in their first annual golf tournament fundraiser at the Woods Golf Resort in Hedgesville. This tournament is a four-man shotgun scramble, teeing off at 10 a.m. If you wish to donate more than the entry fee, we have several different sponsorship levels and we'll be accepting cash donations. So come out and support your Cardinal football team and enjoy some time on the golf course. For more information, call Ted Williams at 304-704-8311 or Scott Highmiller at 301-788-5732. Hi, honey. Where are you? I've been in line at the post office for the last 30 minutes. Why are you at the post office? It'll take you all day. Where else do I go to ship my packages or drop FedEx off at? Honey, going postal is way faster, has less lines, and friendly service. Where's going postal? It's right in the Common Shopping Center in Martinsburg. They'll ship your packages quickly, and you can avoid the lines. Going postal should be your first choice for all your shipping needs. Going postal, the Commons, Martinsburg. The Wellness Center at Berkeley Medical Center has introduced a 10-week sports-specific training program called SPEED for 12- to 17-year-old athletes. The goal of SPEED is to evaluate each individual athlete, assess their deficiencies, and design programs to improve the athlete's performance. The new program for young athletes includes strength and conditioning coaching from the Wellness Center pros as well as the Technogym equipment. If you're interested in building a foundation of long-term athletic success and injury prevention for your athlete, contact the Wellness Center at Berkeley Medical Center. Welcome back into the program, everyone. Uh, nice to have you with us on this uh, Friday morning. For Matt, I think it's going to be a little bit cooler than it has been, huh? That's what I'm hearing. It will be through the weekend once the rain starts coming down. It's pretty sticky out there right now, but uh, rain in the forecast through at least half of the day, cooler temperatures into the weekend. Our uh, sponsors on uh, this segment of the show, L.A. Roberts Jewelers, committed to excellence in quality, design, and craftsmanship in historic downtown Martinsburg, and by the Washington Nationals. Matt, I know you know this, but I'll let our listeners know tonight is uh, bobblehead night for Bryce Harper. Be one of the first 25,000 fans to enter Nationals Park and receive a Bryce Harper patriotic bobblehead. Don't miss the hottest giveaway of the summer. Visit nationals.com for tickets today. And of course, that series will go on all weekend long. Maddie, did you get a chance to uh, catch any of the game last night? I listened to about the first three and a half innings before I decided it was time to go to bed to get up early this morning, and especially because it was 7 to nothing Miami. And I went to bed texting Matt Crawford, talking about Miller time already for today. So much for the team meeting, right? They met after being swept by Boston. The team's going to come out and kick butt and take names. No, they're down 7 nothing, and I thought... All right, let's see what happens next. And to wake up this morning and see the comeback and then to hear some of the highlights. An impressive win, but still got to be some concerns. Biggest comeback in Nats history. I, I don't know if that includes the Expos before them. Is it b biggest in franchise history or just since they've come to Washington? I don't I'm know. assuming since they came to Washington. 
So, but I don't know. You can hear this program, obviously, on 740 AM, 106.5 FM. You can get us on the uh, cable channel 10 uh, in Berkeley and Jefferson County. You can also get us on the stream going to talkradiowrnr.com or on our app, which is reversed, which would be WRNR, uh, Talk Radio. And there's one more way you can get us. Oh, I know. In about two hours, if you missed us today... You can get us on YouTube at YouTube at WRNR TV, and I'm always impressed by the quality of that YouTube uh, transmission. It's pretty nice. It really is, and uh, so very happy with that. We've got the round table with us today. Uh, I uh, cast this party myself, so I'm pretty proud of it. Uh, <laughs> delegate uh, Jason Barrett, Democrat from Martinsburg, Mike Folk, Republican uh, delegate from the 63rd district, and Sammy Brown, candidate. In what district are you running in? 65. 65. 65th District in Jefferson County. Mostly, Jefferson that's County. That's mostly Charlestown. Mostly. Charlestown and Ranson. Okay. Nice to have you guys with us. Before we get into issues that we want to talk about, I wanted to bring in uh, Berkeley County President Doug Copenhaver. Doug, welcome into the program. Good morning, Dave. How are you? You are, uh, you are with us uh, courtesy of the Berkeley and Jefferson County Medical Center, WVU Medicine Talk Line. And uh, Doug, obviously being the president of the Berkeley County Council, sometimes you got to take a tough vote. One of those votes was yesterday on a 3-2 to two vote, one that you favored and voted uh, for, was the vote to raise the, uh, the fees uh, to make sure that we have uh, in Berkeley County uh, hopefully the best uh, possible fire uh, uh, coverage that we, that we can. Um, I'd like for you to just sort of outline uh, what we're paying now, what we're going to pay uh, based upon this vote, and why this vote was important to you. Well, Dave, first of all, uh, you know, some of the stuff that's going around, I just heard on the radio that, uh, you know, we're going to have pay staff 24-7, 365, and five fire halls and three substations. That's what the money is, is uh, set up to do. Uh, we had a public hearing, um, two of them actually, last week, and uh, we listened to the people. They said they, they wanted the service. They, they felt that we needed the service to assist the volunteers, and the only thing that they wanted it to, to, to happen was to phase it in. Um, so we was able to, rather than having four paid firefighters in the five main stations, our proposal to the volunteers would be to put two paid firefighters in the five main stations and also in the three substations. Uh, and that's one of the one of the things that came out of South Berkeley's uh, chief was to that he would be in favor of that more than having four in the main station. So um, to answer your question, what it does is it. it you know, I hate to say double the fee or 200% increase the fee because even if someone was paying $5, you know, the, 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 the delivery uh, sounds wrong. But in reality, what it is is the majority of the people on the residential side is paying a $35 fee for, um, app, it goes towards the apparatuses and paying the light bill and paying for the um, fire halls and things of that nature and, and assisting the fire departments any which way they can. Um, and the staff to run the office. So the the uh, the nine. I'll break it down this way. The nine cents that would be charged to that thirty five dollar additional to that thirty five dollar um, um, uh, homeowner that's currently in the thirty five dollar bracket. It's nine cents a day um, to um, a two. Uh, I can't. I, I would never say a hundred percent, but to uh, get almost a hundred percent guaranteed to get that at least get that truck out the door in plus or minus a minute, and um, that, that's a big thing. And, and again, I'll tell you guys, and I'll tell just like I told told the public, my hat goes off to the, all the volunteers out there, just not in Berkeley County, but throughout the nation. And as Chairman Wilson said in the public hearings, we've ridden the backs of for 60 years of the volunteer fire stations, and we need to respect them. And when we have two of the five fire stations write us letters saying that they need 24-7, 365 because we are failing to get out the door, we need to respond to that. And we've been working on that for quite a while and other, you know, all kinds of different options and things. Matter of fact, uh, the previous president of Bill Stubblefield of the county commission started in 2010. That's why we have paid staff in the fire hall, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., five, all five fire halls. 
One of the reasons that uh, one of the arguments made for this new way of doing things, I think, was because so many fires had gone unresponded to over the last couple of years. Can you address that and tell us how that's going to be different going forward? Well, I think there's a debate on that, Dave, whether the, I've heard from people, uh, one of your uh, people there today, even saying that the numbers are wrong. They're, uh, you know, they're, they're wrong. Well, the good thing about us and any any county in the state of West Virginia, everything that comes through 911 is recorded. Um, now, there's different ways of looking at uh, scratch rates and failure rates and things of that nature. And, and the thing is, is, you know, when, when an alarm goes off and, and you're, reaching out for help for a fire truck to show up um, just because a volunteer fireman or a, someone shows up at the fire with a utility vehicle or show up personally and call in and say I'm on the scene doesn't mean that we're there to put the fire out you know it, it, so we, we got to get the apparatuses there and um, I think the fire the fire board has ran a very uh, uh, good board they've done they've they've watched their finances very, very closely. Uh, matter of fact, to the point where they refinanced one of the fire halls and saved four years of payments. It went from a 14-year payoff to a 10-year payoff day. People don't know that. You know, People don't realize that because the fire board and the county council, we're, we're not the bragging type. We don't have to beat our own drum, you know, and that's throughout the fire board, throughout the ambulance authority, throughout the Every board that I know of that, that I'm very active in, and the county council has done that to the extreme. And, Doug, this only applies to county residents, is that correct, not to city of Martinsburg that, residents? That is correct. And one of the things that the city of Martinsburg already pays $90 per residence. I and, think uh, Hanna Wilson said the city of Martinsburg, Jason, is uh, six square miles. They got one main station and a substation. We've right. got 300 and I think 26 square miles to cover, five main stations and three substations. And we're, you know, we're going to be, if you clustered them all together, we'll probably be under the $90 an hour, uh, uh, a year payment. You know, we may be plus or minus a little bit. I think we're giving a great service. And the volunteers are still doing everything they can. And, and again, my hat goes off to them, those guys. And ladies, they put they put the county and the, their citizens before their own family. They spend hours at the fire station. Before I let uh, some of the others ask questions, if they wish to, uh, would be one last question, and that is: there is a way for this to be undone at the ballot box. Can you explain the process on that? So it's not at the ballot box. There's a petition that can be signed. If, if you, if from what I understand, and I'm not legal counsel, and I'll never, you know, never claim to be. That's why we played Noah Bentley to do that, but. From my understanding is is that the, the, the citizens of Berkeley County have a have a, a, a way to to say no, and that is to sign a petition. They have to be a citizen of Berkeley County, um, and it's it will take 30 percent of the I believe it's the registered voters. Maybe it's the ones that voted in the last election, uh, and they have 45 days from the last uh, uh, publication of the, of the public hearing. I believe is the way I understand. It. So that would be thousands and thousands of brochures. We've got Jason Barrett, Mike Folk, and Sammy Brown here. Um, any questions for the uh, county council president? Uh, Doug, it's Jason. Good morning. Um, Good morning one, of the, the, one of the things that's been talked about a lot is the 10% uh, voter requirement petition mm -hmm. um, to be able to do this. And, you know, I, I think that, that a lot of us have, have talked to council uh, and the legislature, and, and many of them are, are in agreement that that is an, an absolute requirement. Can you talk about your all, the, the county's opinion on that? Well, I can tell you that with our county legal opinion is that, that he feels that that's incorrect. Um, basically, I think that the, the code uh, counter dictates itself and saying, you know, you got to have 10% uh, uh, of, of the uh, registered voters or the voters that voted in the last election um, to sign a petition to do any, any increase in fees. Um, but yet they have the option in 45 days to, to sign another petition to say, no, we're not, we don't want you to go forward with it. Well, you can't have both, Jason. It can't, it's kind of crazy. Um, so, you know, one of the things that one of the things that is that, that is that is happening, and Jason, uh, I, I respect you dearly. I think you're doing a wonderful job. Thank you. But one of the things that we got to do, we got to focus on, is that 
the, the people, the, the one, the elected officials that's the closest to the people of the community is the county commissioner slash county council. You know, we're the closest. You know, we're here every day. Every day we're in town. And, and so, therefore, we've been talking that our number one concern throughout the state of West Virginia is public safety. We've been pleading, give us, give us a way to, to, to make things happen. And, we, and, and no one's prevailed. You know, it, it's like, okay, well, we're going to ignore it. Well, well, I can tell you, I'm the type of person, if I get a letter from two of our volunteer fire departments that says we cannot get out the door to accommodate the volume of calls that's coming in in the current day, I mean, Baker Heights went from 1986 from less than 300 calls to over 1,100 calls. Uh, Back Creek Valley has twice as many calls this year as they had last year. They can't do it. You know, so what am I supposed to do? No, I don't, qu- I don't question the need uh, at all. I, I think right. that, that, that the county is uh, certainly in need of paid uh, firefighters. I think that the volunteer system, um, I, I think those guys are, are and, and ladies are, are second to none in Berkeley County. Uh, I think mm-hmm. the fire board and the county council, have, I think they have demonstrated that fiscal responsibility. Uh, my question is just about the process and making sure that we're doing this consistent with uh, the West Virginia code. Is there any consistent, is there any consideration given to that 10 percent because you know as you talked about the need is there that you've you've listened to voters uh and people mm-hmm. in the county was there any consideration giving to, to doing that petition just to kind of put um you know all the all this to rest with all the the, the the questions about whether this is legal or not have you guys given consideration to doing that petition um here's here's what again here's what it is one of my friends told me that 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 you know, when you when you're not the smartest person in the room, be smart enough to, rip, to to take advice from the one that is, and that's Norwood Bentley, our legal counsel. I thought you were talking about Jason Barrett. No, I, I didn't know where you were going with well, that. Yeah, I wish. Yeah, I'll, I'll go with Jason too, <laughs> but I, I'm talking about yesterday, not today. And uh, but uh, anyway, um, and I did that. I took his advice. His well, advice is that we we didn't need to do it. Um, and here's the, here's the thing, and, and, and remember this, and, and I don't mean this to be in a bad way, but when, when two lawyers go into a courtroom, remember, all lawyers will give you their opinion. Opinion, right? And, and then the two lawyers go into the courtroom, and then the judge is going to give you his opinion of the law, right? So, so we, have two, we have different lawyers saying different opinions. Right, and and the the thing about it is, Jason, I, I don't know. Yes, we, we, we you know, Norwood checked into it. His advice to us, even in the meeting yesterday, and, and during during the, in the public meeting, was he didn't think that we had to do it. So we're talking with Berkeley uh, County President Doug Copenhaver. Uh, Mike Folk, question? Yeah, I mean. W- we have an attorney general's opinion, and that attorney general's opinion dealt with the question of, in basically, you what in the sole question was whether you could use fire fees for uh, paid firefighters. Uh, paid firefighters. Use the fire fee for paid firefighters. And I agree with it that, that you can. I agree with the Attorney General's opinion. Of course, he's the top legal guy in the state, and he's the one that we <laughs> s- s- seek opinions from. Why did you not seek an opinion on this 10% rule as Jim Barnhart uh, suggested that we should go get it an opinion to clarify this legally before it costs you money one way or the other to uh, maybe go to court because there's multiple people out there that are talking about going to court. Well, I guess, I guess there, there's, there's a way to answer that. It, it, you know, if we, if we get challenged in the court, which I'm, I'm sure there's some people out there that would do that and even possibly you, right? But if, if that's the case, then we got, we got to do it because one of the things, one of the things that that I have to tell you, Mike, is you talk about the money, right? The money being spent on the court. How valuable is a human life? How I, valuable I, I, is a I, human I, life? I, no, I'm no, not no, talking because about... that's what it boils down to. Okay. Our volunteer fire departments have already said in writing that we can't get out the door. I understand that. And, now, and, and, I will tell you that Mike Falk wants to take the responsibility of Doug Copenhagen writing a letter to our delegate Falk and telling you that we've done everything possible. We're passing the liability on to you. I think the citizens of Berkeley can say, I did the right thing. 
nobody questions, and you said, what's the value of a human life? Nobody questions that all, that, all life is precious, and uh, that's not the issue here. The issue here is the respect for the, the law and the fact that and, and, and it's, it, the, three, the two people that voted against it voted against it, one, because he thought he wanted an attorney general's opinion, and he thought we should have been, this is Jim Barnhart, he wanted to proceed a little bit more judiciously to make because we're like ramrodding this thing through, and the other one, Dan Dullier, for the specific reason in 717.12, he reads the code the same way many legislators, as Jason said, many legislative attorneys read it. And uh, that's where, if you sought an attorney general's opinion, it would be the most prudent thing to do. And, and not even to mention, and Jim Barnhart mentioned this a little bit about doing it quickly. Well, the thing about that I have a question about, and this is a question that how you answer this, how do you retroactively, because your fiscal year goes from July 1 to June 30th, how are you retroactively increasing a fee? That's, again, Mr. Bentley's the one to set it up, and I'll, I'll lay my money on him. I'm not the legal counsel, nor will I ever claim to be a lawyer and read code. So, 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 when, so that, that's, a, that's a great question. When does this fee, as, as of right now, when does this fee begin to be collected? Well, they actually have to be collected, and uh, let me see. Thanks. You extended October, the, I believe. You, 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 well, yeah, you made an amendment to the, and, and that was a, that was a prudent thing to go, do since you're basically starting a fee retroactively. You extended the time before you would have to pay a penalty. Uh, Hunter Wilson, I think, extended it thirty days. Is that correct, Doug? Yeah, extended 30 days. It's interesting, too, this issue has gotten statewide uh, attention because we will now be, Berkeley County would now be the, I think, the only county of the 55 counties in West Virginia to have essentially a quasi-paid fire department. Yeah, and one of these... Well, the, the it's, it's a combination fire department, Dave. I mean, we, we can't we can't put fires out in one station with two people. No, that's yeah, why I use the word. That's why I use that's request by doing two instead of four, but put them in the substation. And that, that helps even the people out the woods resort. It's that, the same thing as the daytime. We, we got two paid volunteers or two paid firefighters in each of the five fire halls. And we, you know, we still have to depend upon the volunteers. Oh, Doug, I get that. That's why I used the word quasi. I was shortcutting there. Uh, that's a right. uh, combination of paid volunteer. I mean, the, the issue, the biggest issue is our population has grown. As Doug said, our call-outs have grown. But we've actually lost volunteer firefighters. So we need to do Absolutely. something to, to incentivize people to become fire, volunteer firefighters. Uh, and, 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 and one of the things... Part, part of that is years. it's just they're getting older, they're, I think. Well, one of the things that... Like, Pat McGinn actually was the sponsor of it. It was great. It was his idea. Pat McGinn, you might even be able to build. Delegate Pat McGinn Delegate from the Pat first district of West Virginia. The, from the fighting first, as he calls it. He introduced a bill, and I'm, I'm the co-sponsor on it, to basically eliminate the state taxation of income on volunteer firefighters. And that would incentivize people to be volunteer firefighters, especially young people that are just getting started out. The one thing I, I would encourage you to do, if the bill doesn't include it, is in order to... When, when it, it, let's use Baker Heights as an example. Um, Baker Heights, again, this come from Chief Roberts, had 15 people within a two-mile race to get the fire truck out of the door within four minutes of the call going out in 1986. Today, soon to be, he'll have one. He has three currently, I believe they said. One of them just had a, a child that says, I, I can't do it at the volume I used to do. One of them's leaving, I think they said, going to South Carolina. So, so, the, the only the, the, the thing that I would add to that bill, if it's not in there, is that we will pay you to be at the fire hall and on on some ships so well, that you can get the truck out in a timely manner. And, and that I, was I don't know how to get it out that fast. We discussed that. I discussed that with a few people that we had to put. To, we would have to uh, fix that bill and make some uh, provisions to where they had to be available a certain number of days uh, for call outs uh, per year to be eligible for that tax benefit because that's what you need you need the you need the coverage like you said you need to be on call you need to be within a minute or two of the fire hall doug thanks for joining us today any last words on this issue at all uh my only last words is berkeley county is not the only county suffering this you you even in the tri-state area frederick county virginia is, is advertising on the radio the volunteers are trying to recruit and retain uh washington county is and and from my understanding it's a statewide problem so uh, the, the the work to be done at the at the state level there's plenty of it there to do and and uh, try to help out the other 54 counties. So 
That's all I got to say. Doug Copenhaver, president of the Berkeley County uh, Council. I always want to say commission. I, I, I change challenge that way. But thanks so much for joining us, especially uh, on the last minute uh, call that I put into you today, Doug. Thanks so much. Have a great weekend. Thank you. A minute left. Recap, Jason? Well, you know, I, I think that we're all in agreement of the, the need and the demand. And, and I think that, that, that we all appreciate everything that the volunteer firefighters do, uh, what the fire board and Hunter Wilson and, 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 and the, the fiscal responsibility that the county has shown. I, I think our disagreement comes with the process um, and, and our interpretation of the code. And, and my question to Doug was, even though the county's position is, the, at least Norwood's uh, uh, opinion, and who is a, a fine attorney, uh, his opinion is that the 10 percent is not required if there is such this huge demand in the county which i believe that there probably is why don't we do the 10 percent petition anyway even though they can say it's not necessary um, and, and some of us believe that it is why don't we start that process why didn't we get the 10 percent uh, petition in order to move forward and, and make it and keep everybody happy uh, well the first of all the 10 percent has worked out to be i did the numbers based on june 1st uh Registrations. It's 6,381, just under 6,400 people is what they would need to get signatures. Interesting. We had that whole discussion, and there wasn't a single mention. And I have Sammy, you're Jefferson County, so right. you probably stayed out of that well, a little I, bit. I mean, I did. I, I think, really, for me, I had a couple questions. Like, if we are asking for the populace to invest in this, and there is a failure rate, is there going to be a, a decrease in the failure rate? Are you going to see a return on the exchange? And then also, you know, it's a little concerning to me that you wouldn't ask for the opinion of the people prior to moving this forward. Yeah, that is an interesting, uh, you know, question too. I mean, it would seem this kind of rises to the level, and I'm just speaking now as a citizen, not as a talk show host, but just uh, as a taxpayer, this does seem to kind of rise to the level of vote. We need to take a short break. We're going to come back with more Eastern Panhandle talk with Rob and Dave. This is the political crew, Jason Barrett, Mike Folk, and Sammy Brown. We'll be back. Are you playing the Foo Fighters? This is CBS News on the Hour, sponsored by TheraWorks Relief. I'm Deborah Rodriguez. Another round of shots fired in the U.S.-China trade conflict. The Trump administration went first at a minute past midnight, imposing $34 billion in new tariffs on Chinese products. Beijing was quick to retaliate. White House correspondent Stephen Portnoy. The president insists the move is necessary to combat Chinese theft of American technical know-how. As economists brace for a trade war, Mr. Trump warns the 25% tariff imposed today on $34 billion worth of goods could soon be followed by tariffs on $200 billion more and $300 billion more after that. Beijing says it's hitting back, having previously warned it would target U.S. soybeans, cars, and whiskey. We're just in. Russia is chiming in with new import duties on some U.S. goods. The economy's humming right along with 213,000 new jobs created in June and unemployment up just a touch to 4%. PNC's chief economist, Gus Fauché. Solid job gains in manufacturing, about 36,000 jobs. Uh, construction continues to do well. Uh, business services, uh, education and health care, travel and tourism. So everything looks pretty solid. Wages still flat. So are S&P futures. With monsoon rains in the forecast for the weekend and oxygen levels dropping inside, crews in Thailand are working with new urgency to rescue 12 boys and their soccer coach who've been trapped in a cave for two Two weeks. CBS's Ben Tracy is outside. Now with few options left to actually rescue them, crews here have been surveying the cave complex from above, trying to find other entrances and even considering drilling a hole down in the mountain to try to reach them. A former Navy Thai SEAL who'd volunteered to place oxygen canisters inside the cave has died himself from a lack of oxygen. The death toll up to 33 after a tourist boat capsized in rough seas off Thailand's resort island of Phuket. Monsoon season can generate high winds and flash storms. EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt exits under a cloud of scandal. Elena Saxonhouse at the Sierra Club says policy change is a must. We really have to restore public trust in EPA and let the agency fulfill its mission rather than gut the laws that keep our families safe, which is what Pruitt was doing. Environmentalists say they don't have much hope in Deputy EPA Administrator and former coal industry lobbyist Andrew Wheeler who's been tapped as Pruitt's temporary replacement. About a 1,000 people have been evacuated from their homes in Hornbrook, California, just over the Oregon border, where a wildfire has jumped across Interstate 5. Cal Fire Susie Brady. Right now it's about 5,000 acres, 0% contained. Um, we do have multiple structures that have been damaged and destroyed. This is CBS News.
To prevent and relieve muscle cramps in your legs and feet, use TheraWorks Relief. Get TheraWorks Relief today at select Walgreens, CVS, and Rite Aid pharmacies or theraworksrelief.com. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. ZipRecruiter posts your job to over 100 job boards with just one click, and then their smart matching technology finds the right candidates. Try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash free. To prevent muscle cramps in your legs and feet, use TheraWorks Relief. This fast-acting foam is clinically proven to relieve leg and foot cramps. Get TheraWorks Relief today at select Walgreens, CVS, and Rite Aid pharmacies or TheraWorksRelief.com. Ask your pharmacist for a TheraWorks Relief. Hey, Dave. You in for golf this weekend? Oh, I can't. I promised I'd find a plumber to fix a sink and a painter to paint Just them. use Angie's List. Uh, doesn't that cost money? Not at all. It's free to find pros in your area who can do the work. You can even read ratings and reviews from other customers. What about roofing pros? Angie's List has pros for everything. And to save time, they'll even match you to the best pros for the job. Oh, that's awesome. Looks like I'll be able to play after all. Find the now your local news from Talk Radio WRNR. They'll be passing the boot around to help out a fellow firefighter. Lieutenant Brian Galladay, who's been with the South Berkeley Volunteer Fire Department for 17 years and been a firefighter for 30, is suffering from colon cancer. Not only his colleagues, but those from other area fire departments will be having a boot drive tomorrow from 9 a.m. till 1 p.m. at multiple locations around the area. And then on Sunday, the Beddington Volunteer Fire Department will have the boot out for him at the Spring Mills Walmart from noon till 4. An alert from the West Virginia Division of Highways, the Waterwheel Bridge on Cable Town Road will be closed to traffic beginning as early as this coming Monday. The bridge closure will be in place 24 hours a day until the work's completed. They're replacing the bridge superstructure over Evitts Run. And those who receive Medicaid benefits in West Virginia will, as of this Sunday, be eligible for coverage of more treatment for substance abuse issues. I'm Adam Boardman, Talk Radio WRNR News. Local forecast, weatherman Bob Kukin. Keeping an eye on weather radar this morning, showers and thunderstorms in the forecast. With the approach of the cool front that we've been watching off to the west and the northwest over the last couple of days, it'll be coming on through here during the day, breaking the back of the heat wave that's been with us here now for a week, and looking at some much more seasonally mild temperatures in here for the weekend before we start to heat up once again early next week. Today's rain probably confined to the first half of the day. The showers tapering off, some sunshine returning by mid-afternoon. In the meanwhile, there could be some heavy downpours this morning. Temperatures near 84 degrees for our high. Fair skies tonight, the low 60. I'm Bob Kukin, Talk Radio, WRNR. Smith Bush is an independent insurance agency. You see, there's an important difference between Smith and Aiden Bush and agents who work just for one company. Working for one company, they can only sell the products of that company. On the other hand, Smith and Aiden Bush can design a program just for you, your family, or your business, and at the right cost. Smith and Aiden Bush. Martinsburg, Charlestown, and Berkeley Springs. Downtown Martinsburg is the place to be for the Fridays at Five Summer Concert Series from June 1st through August 31st. Enjoy great music and fun with well-known musicians, bands, and Martinsburg artists that will liven up your spirits at the town square. Concerts begin at 5 p.m. and usually last until 7. Enjoy great music while visiting Martinsburg's Farmer's Market, housed on East King Street, where you're able to enjoy fresh fruits and veggies, chicken and pork, and a lot more. Pets are allowed in the square during the concerts, provided they're on a six-foot leash or less. For the full concert summer series lineup, go to MainStreetMartinsburg.com. I'm Matt Miller. I'm Matt Crawford. We may share the same name, but that doesn't mean we always share the same opinions. Because I believe in my guy. Because 70% of the time I'm going to get him out. This time he got the better of us and hit a home run. Congratulations, Bryce Harper. Now shut up and let's play tomorrow because that's what baseball does. Pitch to him. You know what fixes intentionally walking guys? If everybody around him is hitting the ball. Listen to their take on sports weekday evenings at 5 p.m. on Miller Time on Talk Radio WRNR, the Panhandle Sports Radio Station. Robin Dave. I am the Dave part. The Rob part is off today. Yesterday, his first day, and today, his second day of the entire year. 
on vacation. How many of you have a record like that? That's what I call a strong work ethic. And speaking of strong work ethic, sitting in for Rob, Matt Miller, sports director and host of Miller Time at 5 o'clock here on WRNR. Matt? I know we're about to talk impeachment. I am not in favor of impeaching Rob. I want him to stay on this morning show as long as possible, please. Okay, I was going to make a motion so. that we change the name of the show, but I'll hold back on that. Uh, okay. Wait, we what would you change it to? Uh, Eastern Panel will talk with Dave and Dave. <laughs> Just Dave and Dave. Or Dave and Sammy. How's that? Ooh. Yeah, yeah, that, Sorry, Rob, you're out. I mean, we would make a good team. We'd be a think? fantastic Okay, you drop team. that candidacy of yours, we'll bring you in. <laughs> Sammy Brown from Jefferson County running for a state delegate. Mike Folk, who is a state delegate running for state senate. Jason Barrett, state delegate running again for state delegate. All part of the round table today with Matt and I. And it's nice to have uh, you along with us. Also nice to have great sponsors like Brown Funeral Homes and Cremations, Robert Fields and Sons a family-owned full-service funeral home that has proudly served our area since 1980 and the Ferretti Law Office delivering first-rate service and results for our clients. I happen to know that Joe's having a family day with his daughters today, so Aww. hope that he enjoys uh, his day off and, uh, and uh, probably some much-anticipated uh, family time at the Ferretti household. We have talked a lot over the past couple of weeks, and we have talked about it with Patricia Rucker in the first 20 minutes of the show today about the impeachment. And it's hard to get away from, from the topic, really, in West Virginia these days, because we not only have an active impeachment uh, process going on in the State House of Delegates uh, with Alan Loffrey, the now former Chief Justice and still, I guess, a member of the State Supreme Court in West Virginia. We also have the possibility of other State Supreme Court justices being impeached, and now there's a movement afoot to also impeach the governor, of mm -hmm. all people. Sammy, as you follow this news, what are your general thoughts on this, not only as a candidate but as a taxpayer and a citizen? Um, is Does this look like we're doing the right thing or they're doing the right thing in Charleston to be pursuing um, all of these impeachments? Because I can guarantee you that it's a sad process when right. you start talking about impeaching elected officials. And I don't care if it's Donald Trump or Alan Loffrey or whatever. I was... Uh, a college intern in 1974 on Capitol Hill for three months, it, of all summers to pick to be a college intern, it happened to be 1974, which was the summer of the Nixon impeachment. Right. And uh, so it was sad then, and it's always sad, but uh, sometimes you just have to deal with it. So I think my general thoughts about this are that corruption happens to be a unifying topic for both parties. It's one of those things that no populace is going to tolerate. It's not something that they want in their government. I will say that we have to kind of be careful about this, though, because we in West Virginia have seen civic engagement decrease every year consistently. And when you're seeing that kind of volatility in your government, you're going to lose faith in the people that lead you. And it won't matter who we put in there. It won't matter the kind of quality of candidate that we put in there. All of a sudden, folks are going to say all politicians are the same. They're always saying that. You raise a really good point because I do think when you when voters look at what's going on in the state of West Virginia, and you, I guess you could make an argument that now they're really mad and they're going to show up they've and they want, they're going to, they want to change the system. But I hear you saying it actually has the opposite effect. People say it, it sort of depresses their interest in getting involved. Well, it absolutely has. And so you have a rise of movement, right? And I will not deny the fact that there there is very much a resistance movement that is across the nation and has emerged within West Virginia, and you've seen it. You've seen it when it came to the teacher strikes. You saw it when it came to health care. But what I am also saying is that the folks that don't turn into that type of engagement, to that type of protest action, your voice is heard on, in the ballot box. And if you're not taking the time to engage in that way, it's probably because you don't believe anymore. And so when we have these conversations, I know that this is kind of the let's fire them segment, but I also need... To, I need us to pivot into a way that's actually going to be productive for our, for our communities. That's going to actually say how we can re-engage them, what the solution is, how do we fix this. Our phone number here at Eastern Pendental Talk is 304-263-6540 if you'd like to enter into the discussion. Savan, our summer intern, I have an assignment for you. 
the assignment. You good with that? Let's put on our Facebook out there to our listeners. Uh, do you favor? Do you support or oppose the impeachment of Governor Jim Justice? Let's put that out on our Facebook and see what kind of response we get back. Okie dokie. Michael, you said you have, Michael Folk, you said that uh, that it might not only be Alan Lawfrey, it might be a couple of other members of the state Supreme Court. I know you sit as a member of the House of Delegates, and you there might be things you know that you can't say, but knowing you, you'll say them anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what new news can you impart on the topic? Well, I, you know, I'm, first of all, I've learned in six years to be a little more cautious. Yes, you have. Uh, have you? <laughs> you're much more well-behaved than you were in long ago. six years. <laughs> but, you know, to be frank, there's, uh, first of all, the resolution that we passed for impeachment doesn't specify anybody by name. It says one or all. And I, I'm pretty, and I think Jason will agree with me, two of them are gone. It's very clear, two justices. Alan Loffrey and... and Probably men to catch them are the two that for basically the same reasons, uh, similar in different ways. Yeah, I mean uh, some of the stuff I'm privy to and Jason is too. I don't think we want to divulge because some of it's not made public yet. But but some of the issues are, are very serious, and we're talking about not just impeachable matters but criminal matters. Uh, I'm, I talked to somebody very high up the criminal justice food chain yesterday, and I won't mention him by name. But he indicated that he agreed with me that two of them are gone and. And actually four are being criminally investigated. Jason, one of the interesting parts of this discussion, it seems to me, as an outsider, and Sammy kind of alluded to it, that corruption is, I think in her words, corruption is a unifying factor. Other than the Democrats in the legislature uh, trying to pass uh, a measure that would speed the process up, other than that issue, which I consider to be kind of a small issue myself, there does seem to be a lot of uh, uniting on this issue in the House of Delegates. It doesn't have the appearance of being partisan to me. Well, you know, when Rob Cornelius, uh, who you, you guys have had on a couple of times, the Deputy Republican the chair, chair of Wood County, County right. uh, when, when he is in agreement with uh, Democrats, um, I think that that proves Sammy's point that, that corruption does unify, because any time that those two sides can come together, um, it, it's almost a historic event. Um, but, you know, I th he talked yesterday a lot about um, the, impeaching the governor and that there were 35 of the 36 Democrats already willing and, and ready to do that. Now, I can tell you Rob Cornelius hasn't asked me my opinion on that, so I'm not sure where he's getting that number of 35. Oh, okay. Um, I just assumed and, and I'm not saying, right. I'm not saying that the 35 is wrong. I'm just saying that I don't know that he's actually polled uh, the, the members of, of, of the House caucus of, on Maybe the Democratic side. you're the one he left out. By the way, I doubt it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I can actually, actually, he named the one who was actually someone who yeah. I think lives down in Greenbrier County. Yeah, and, I, and I can add to this... Uh, chain of thought is that, you know, I had an impeachment resolution for the governor during the session. It was late February, and I obtained 11 Republican signatures at the time. I went to Tim Miley, the minority leader, to see if I could get his signature, because that usually leads to the rest of the Democrats. And which well, that's I, interesting. If you still have the 11, and uh, there, if Cornelius is right, that there well, are 35 Democrats, you're getting precariously close to that 51 number, aren't well, you? Well, and what, what happened at the time, Tim was not ready to do it. And but he is. I'm pretty sure from our conversations I talked to him the other night, he's definitely ready to do it. Maybe uh, that's where Cornelius is getting his numbers from. And, and you know, uh, to to Rob's credit, and you know, I'm the same way. I've I've called people out from both sides of the aisle. If in Jason will know, he was hammering justice uh, from when he was a Democrat, and he continued to hammer him when he became a Republican. It didn't matter that he changed parties. I mean, his actions are. What they are, and, and the, of course, the biggest issue at the time that I called for that, at least investigating, it wasn't the articles of impeachment, but the question was, are you following the Constitution? Okay, let me. Or you let have me to reside in, in this seat of government. Let, let, I can't disagree with that. However, let me give you another perspective, and I'll compare Alan Lawfrey with Jim Justice. Mm -hmm. Alan Lawfrey apparently has committed some really bad things. Yes. I mean, he has lied to the FBI. Apparently, he has lied to the House uh, Finance Committee. He has stolen state property. He has submitted illegal uh, expense reports. I mean, he has spent $30,000. Was he the $30,000 couch guy? $32,000. Yes. $32,000 couch guy. And a couple thousand dollars I mean, for a pillow. And, and the list goes on and on. 
I look at Jim Justice and I look at the impeachable, the impeachable, the possible impeachment allegations against the governor seem really pale to the ones against Alan Lawfrey. And let me just finish the statement, Mike. It would be, I don't, I'm, the Constitution is written pretty vaguely when it comes to, to um, impeachment, it seems to oh, me. For impeachment, yes. Yeah, for impeachment. So, as a, as a citizen... I'm not sure I want to support an impeachment move because he chooses not to go to his office every day or chooses not to live in the mansion every day or, you know, I'm not, I'm not willing to say, yeah, let's impeach a guy that the people of West Virginia elected if those are the allegations against him. What are the more, what would some of the more serious possible allegations against the governor going above, he doesn't show up for work and doesn't live in the mansion? Well, f since February, when, when I did that, and the thing that I think has changed the, the minds of his, the minority leader, at least, in my conversations with him, is that, you know, not living there has actually led to being asleep at the wheel in the executive branch. I mean, we have, all we have to do is look at RISE, what's going on in the Department of Commerce, with all the flood relief. Uh, there's, the, of course, the... And some of these things, especially like the, what I'm going to talk about, the million dollars that was spent on an empty building or an empty office space for the HHR. That actually started, ironically, in 2015, which, of course, was we were, that was clear back in Tomlin's administration. Mm -hmm. So, and Karen Bowling at the time was the DHHR uh, head, which is interesting enough. She went, she's now working for WVU Hospitals. Uh, <laughs> she was a, the secretary of DHHR. So the things that have led him not being there led to other things, the, the, the maladministration, which is what's actually... A reference in the Constitution where we've basically had two years, over two years now since the flood, not one house, not one person has gotten the keys to one house. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. It is, an, it is an absolute tragedy, and if the blame for that can be uh, laid upon the chief executive as uh, Marshall Wilson, I think, pretty clearly laid the blame upon the chief executive yesterday using military terminology uh, in a way that I, you know, I could understand that because malmanagement is, in fact, an impeachable offense. But you can define malmanagement in a number of ways, can't you? Actually, it's, it's well, pretty, pretty clearly defined in Merriam-Webster's dictionary. Okay, there you go. Well, and I think, David, the rise West Virginia, that issue, I think, is the biggest um, for the governor. And, and because... Huge. Yeah, because you had Woody Thrasher, who was head of commerce, who is a, a very successful businessman, a multimillionaire. Uh, the governor, who is, is a successful businessman, uh, a billion, the state's only billionaire. You don't come to that wealth and that success in business by being incompetent. So these are not incompetent people, but clearly in this job, they have shown a whole lot of incompetence, or uh, maybe there's some corruption along the way. Now, you, you know, you, you don't become that wealthy and that successful by being incompetent. Maybe by being a shark you can, but, but there is absolutely no excuse for this. And, and I haven't heard the governor once take any responsibility for that. And I think that, that Marshall Wilson, who he and I disagree on a regular basis, but he made a very good point yesterday that it's ultimately the chief executive's responsibility. You know, the buck has to stop somewhere. The governor wants to take no responsibility whatsoever. And that, that to me, um, is alarming as, as a taxpayer because... You know, we, we put trust in our government, we put trust in our leadership to do the right thing. And when something goes wrong, I expect the, the leader to stand up and say, you know what, this falls in my lap at the end of the day. I had people in place that were supposed to do a job. They, they, they weren't able to do that. We have replaced them. It's now my responsibility. I'm going to see that it's corrected. Well, he hasn't done any of that. What is going on now? I mean, he has General Hoyer out there who I have a tremendous amount of respect for, who, is, who has kind of become the face of RISE now. Uh, but ultimately, a lot of these decisions are still within the Commerce Department. So, you know, I don't know that there – what is the uh, corrective action plan – to, to start funding uh, the rebuilding of these houses and getting these people back in their home, uh, that hasn't been outlined to me. So, so I, I think there is, is clear incompetence on the governor's part and, and no willingness or, or no transparency, transparency to see how this is getting corrected. I mean, I think the word is actually negligence. I think you're actually neglecting the tasks of being the highest office in the land. And I don't think that it's enough for you to do what you did during your campaign strategy, which was let's house the people in the Greenbrier doesn't work that way. Now we need a sustainable plan. And so it goes far beyond grandstanding. It goes far beyond this one generous, or if you want to call it a generous act, you now have to actually take care of the people of West Virginia. 
And I'm not sure the man really understood what that meant. I'm not sure that he really understood what it meant to take well, care of sure the agree with you. I'm quite sure I agree with that. Mm -hmm. Well, the one thing that most people don't realize is that, and this has been reported in the media, so it's, I mean, take it for what it is, uh, the big Metro News. You know, the, the one of the largest contractors, the biggest portion of the $49 million contract for construction went to a co company called Thompson Construction. And there's a, there's a common thread in a lot of this. And these are, they, got, they got quite a bit of money, didn't they? Well, uh, yeah, they, out of the $49 million, I think they got, uh, they, worked, uh, they got over half of the $49 million. And, and, and their what, lobbyists, what, what were they tasked to do? Those, that was the construction company that was supposed to be building these houses. Oh, it is, okay. And their lobbyist, their chief lobbyist, is a guy named Larry Puccio. If you know that name... There's a long history of Larry Puccio. He's the one also that was trying to get the, what do you call it, integrity fee uh, mm -hmm. forced yep. down the throats. So and, and there's a lot of political connections that are maybe make my people the right and left of me right now <laughs> very uncomfortable. Doesn't bother me. No, we're fine. But, but, but it, Larry Puccio, of course, is running Senator Manchin's re-election campaign. He was also the uh, coordinator of the transition for the Justice Administration. So he's got the ear of the governor. And uh, again, the, the, and then if you want to go the, the, another step, the person that I think is the most influential that until recently wasn't even an employee of the state is a guy named Bray Carey, who is, an, is a lobbyist. He's not a lobbyist. Probably does do lobby. He says he doesn't, but he, he sits on the board of the EQT and has the ear of the governor constantly. And I think there's a serious conflict of interest there that you sit on the board of the EQT, the largest natural gas uh, company in the state of West Virginia probably, and he's, and there's these cross-party aisles. I mean, the one guy's a Democrat, the other guy, I don't know what he is, Bray Carey, but he's, he's a very uh, well-paid board member, makes over $300,000 to sit on the EQT board, and he has the ear of the governor and does most of the governor's work. For instance, last week, the whole ATPC Blue Ribbon Commission was the result of a meeting where Gordon Gee flew down and had dinner at Edgewood, Edgewood Country Club with Bray Carey and the head of the chairman of the ATPC. And they were actually going to violate state law, is what I heard, to remove the, the, the current uh, chancellor. But instead, they realized... They got called out on so it. So why are we bringing the the university president into this now? I mean, well, it seems saying? that it's from what I've seen, some of these people that are, are started some of the bad things that were the, in the executive administration, secretary of DHHR, are now working for WVU or WVU connected entities. For instance, another person mentioned in this article, Mary Jo Thompson. There's rumor has it that she's headed got another new employment, and there's a there's a, a uh, a trend here that is very disturbing. And you talk about waste? Okay, Gordon Gee is wasting a million dollars a year flying around the country. Okay, bring that back then to the topic of these people aren't getting their homes. Because I think you kind of lost me with the Thompson. Thompson's lobbyist is the same well, guy who's Joe Manchin's campaign manager and was the head of Jim Justice's transition team, yes, correct? Okay. Yes, so he's been in So are you making an allegation that there's just general widespread corruption going on? There, I mean, well, there's, amongst a, there's a some cabal, very, kind of a cabal of a You can people. start making some, connecting the dots, the same names keep sh showing up. And, 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 and it's, a, it's, a, it's a bipartisan thing because some of these people have been in both administrations, so... Right. I think, yeah, I mean, I think maybe that was my question for Mike is connect the dots for me. Like what, it, it all sounds like folks are coming to suckle at the power teat, if you will. I mean, well, the, excuse the analogy, but. The, 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 the example, another thing that you're talking about the natural gas industry, you have this big China energy deal that we signed an MOU. And this was disturbing <clears throat> that the, the gentleman I talked to yesterday that's very high up the, the, you know, the criminal justice food chain wasn't aware of it. So I, that's the reason I reached out to him, because I wanted to see if he had heard some of the things that I had heard. And uh, one of them is that the MOU, which is Memorandum of Understanding uh, for the China Energy deal, that $80 some billion dollar deal, mm -hmm. is not public yet. Right. And uh, people have asked, and he's like, what? He didn't believe it. And I said, yeah, there's actually a suit going on up in uh, Morgantown right now trying to make it public. Because it should be a public document. It should be foilable. So hyper-localize this for me. With all of that going up at, on at the top of the food chain, what does that do to people here at home? So folks here in Berkeley and Jefferson County, like how does that directly impact them? Well, your money's being wasted. So you're, 
you know, instead of getting lower taxes or, or being able to spend money, for instance, the perfect example is the most underfunded institution, higher ed, is Shepherd. Mm -hmm. And money that's being blown on buildings that are empty and, and not being used, money that's being blown at the Supreme Court that, that was wasted, money that's being blown on Gordon Gee's travel, that money should be coming back here in the form of, you know, more uh, – accurate or more reasonable funding for Shepherd as relative to the other institutions. So I agree with you. And mind you, I, I really asked just so we could have the transparency on the show, but what it really comes down to, in my opinion, is that maybe the man isn't impeachable, but he damn sure shouldn't be reelected. And it, what it comes down to is that we have ways to fund things that are underfunded here on a very, very local level in a way that could take the burden off of working families, that could take the burden off of their backs, and yet it's being wasted at the top down. What's really fa you, ask, you ask a great question, Sammy. What's really fascinating to me about this governor, and you look at the poll numbers, any poll that's, been, that's come out that is unfavorable numbers, unfavorable to favorable, are, are extremely low, especially for one who's been in office for such a short time. Right. It's almost, you know, it's one in five people in West Virginia approve of the job that he's doing. That's a horrible, horrible ratio. And that it, and there, there again, it's kind of a unifying thing because it's across the board. And I wonder in some cases, if it was because of the party switch. He was elected be. as a Democrat, switched parties to Republican, and well, no one's... He does, it's like, he has, it's like does he has no island He has no island to go to. Well, I, I don't know that it's his party switch. I think it's the way that he operates. Um, and, and I think that he has uh, an inability to get along and to compromise with folks. Um, I think that he's so used to having things his way where he is you know, the boss at the Greenbrier and, and, and all his various businesses. I, I think it's a fundamental lack of understanding of... Uh, three equal branches of government. He, he looks down at the legislature. He doesn't think that the legislative branch is the equal to the executive branch. And I, I think that's where a lot of this problem stems from. Um, you know, when, when he was a Democrat, um, he wanted to, to, to do some things that went against Democratic principles. And, and that's when he switched parties. You know, he went over uh, to the Republicans. And now, you know, there's friction, uh, obviously, in the Republican Party with, with members of the legislature, with members of the, the, the party and him. Um, and, and he's very upset. And I think Rob Cornelius alluded to it uh, yesterday that, that there's been some private meetings uh, between the governor and, and Republican leadership where there's a lot of friction where he ends up yelling at the, the, the party chair. And so I think it's, you know, the, the common denominator in this is him, that he is the one that's, that has this inability to get along with folks. And I, I think it's, again, yeah. running, running the state like a business and having a business guy sounds great, but you have to be able to understand the process. You have to be able to, to, to work in state government and understand that the legislature is an equal branch of government. Yeah, and I'll add to what Jason said. You know, the Democrats had trouble with him when he was a Democrat uh, in the legislature. There were buttonheads. Of course, we were buttonheads with him at the time because they were, he was offering a $450 million tax increase even though he ran on no, new, no tax increases. Mm -hmm. And now, now they were a little bit probably less Mike Folk-like in their approach to dealing with his... Well, you should have been in a couple of those caucuses. Well, I'm sure in the caucuses, proud. but you're not as, they're not as public as, you know, if I think a Republican is stepping out of line, I'll call them out and, and Rob Cornelius is that way too and so we're le I'm a little less polite when I do it in the sense that I, I just put out the facts there and here they are I think you're wrong and you should live in Charleston <laughs> that kind of thing the 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 governor going back to re-election I would not imagine that's probably he in his plans whether possibly. he gets impeached or not My it, doesn't, goodness. it doesn't seem unless he had one of the biggest comebacks of all time when he made the switch and of course he made it with Donald Trump came to West Virginia and made that announcement and there it's fascinating to me because people like to compare the two of them I mean you know they're both fellow billionaires so they all automatically have a kind of a small club uh, thing going on but as Donald Trump's numbers seem to rise in the nation, right. uh, you know, ever so slowly his handling of the economy and other things, you know, much higher than they were a year ago, 10 or 11 points ahead of where they were, justices seem to be slipping. So You want to know the, why, though? The because Trump, yeah, I do. Tell me why. Because one appears to be direct and concise and transparent, appears. The other one, however, does not. There is a, a factor of charisma. There's a factor of personality. And one tried to ride the coattails of the other. One tried to hold a, a freaking rally to announce that he's switching parties. Who does that? Who does that? But in the meantime, you have another man that 
A, is trying to connect with his populace, that's trying to reconnect with his base, uh, that wants to speak to them on a consistent level. The other man doesn't know how to. He has absolutely no idea how to speak to people, whether it's one side or the other. Well, I, I think the president is successful a lot of the times because he's able to identify a, a boogeyman, for, for lack of a better term. He, he is able to, to throw bombs at folks. He's able to, to find a, a, a political enemy. And, and, he, and his base fuels off of that. The governor ha doesn't have the ability to do or hasn't had the ability to do that. He is playing defense all the time, and, and the president is able to play offense. And, and I think that's a big difference. I, I don't think it's any coincidence, Dave, that uh, after the justice's poll numbers come out, that the governor makes a trip to the White House, and then a week later, uh, the president makes a trip to the Greenberg. That's a very good point. Let's take one, a short, uh, one last thing. Yeah, Mike. 80, the difference between the two, 80% of being successful is showing up. Trump shows up, justice doesn't. Matt, what's the music the, on that. What, what, what's, the, what's the most important part about being a talk show host? Showing up. Got to be here. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to take just a short break. We're going to be back with Sammy Brown, Mike Folk, and Jason Barrett. Stay with us. You're listening to Eastern Panhandle Talk with Rob and Dave. been injured, you're missing work, the medical bill collectors keep calling, and the other person's insurance company wants a lot of confusing paperwork signed and returned. At Ferretti Law Office, we handle these situations to protect your rights and get you the compensation you deserve. We explain how the insurance coverages work for your benefit and what a lawyer like me can do to make a difference. Call Ferretti Law Office at 264-8505 to schedule an appointment to discuss your situation for free. At Ferretti Law Office, we're here to help. Since 1877, Farmers and Mechanics Insurance Companies have proudly supported our local community. Farmers and Mechanics has the insurance products to meet your needs, including home, auto, farm, dwelling fire, business owners, and umbrella coverage. Please contact your local independent agency for a review of your insurance needs and ask for a policy from the company that knows you best. Farmers and Mechanics Insurance Companies, just off Edwin Miller Boulevard on Administrative Drive in Martinsburg. FMIWV.com. L.A. Roberts is Berkeley County's oldest jeweler, where every season is new and exciting. In fact, new is old school to us, and though it's nothing new, our old traditions like exceptional service, quality, and value maintain L.A. Roberts Jewelers as the old master among so many new kids on the block. Whether you're a newcomer or part of the old guard, entrust all your fine jewelry needs to L.A. Roberts, old world jewelers for a new age in historic downtown Martinsburg. The Honda 4th of July sales event has brilliant deals on our most popular vehicles, like the Civic, Fit, and Pilot. It's a reason to celebrate across the country, from the Liberty Bell to Hollywood, and even back up to Niagara Falls. So come discover the 2018 KBB.com Best Overall Brand during the Honda 4th of July sales event, now at your Honda dealer. Miller Honda, south of Winchester, home of the Lifetime Power Train Warranty, www.mymillerhonda.com. Based on 2018 brand image awards from Kelly Playbook, visit KBB.com for more information. What is this? Happy anniversary, honey. What did you do to our front yard? You know what they say. Baseball diamonds are a girl's best friend. Nope, that's not a thing. Daydreaming of sparkling views, upper deck homers, and diving catches? There's a place for that. Nationals Park. Your Washington Nationals are home for a series against the Miami Marlins from July 5th through the 8th. Get your tickets at nationals.com. See you at Nationals Park, your place for day night. Welcome back into the last half hour of uh, Eastern Panhandle Talk with Rob and Dave. This segment brought to you by Bechtel Jewelers, West Virginia's largest Pandora retailer on Route 11 South Inwood next to Viva Mexico. Or is it Mexico? I guess it depends where you are. I think it's just Mexico. That's How they, the way I see it. Are they it. out of the World Cup, by the way? I, you know, I... I I have not paid enough attention. To I'm the embarrassed World Cup. that I haven't, and I get actually uh, yelled at sometimes by 
friends of mine, what do you mean you're not watching the World Cup? I said, I only watch the World Cup when the U.S. is in it because I'm patriotic. I was going to say, I think I, that's the big issue. I'm not going to watch, uh, I'm not going to watch Saudi Arabia uh, play Mexico <laughs> and watch no goals scored for 90 minutes. And I don't care what, what level it is. It's just not that interesting to me. It's a lot different in Portugal, I can tell you that. Yeah, I'm sure it is. Every, it is. every outdoor cafe has a big screen TV sitting out in the... In the cafe, and they're watching it. Bring on the NBA. I want 120 points scored. That's what I want. I want lots of points scored in the game. <laughs> Bring on the NBA, <laughs> really? I, mean, I like baseball games that are 14 to 11. You know, I mean, I don't know. I'm just, uh, I watched a lot of soccer when I was in high school because both boys played soccer. And I went to every game, and then they would make the playoffs, and I went to more games. And finally, Pete, who played at Berkeley Springs, uh, had played in his final soccer game ever. It was the last game I ever had to go to. Yeah. I, that was it. Well, lo and behold, because they had lost in the playoffs, and lo and behold, he makes all states, so he goes and plays in that <laughs> north-south game in Parkersburg or whatever. So off to three-hour drive I went to watch one more soccer game, and I was done. Never had to go to another soccer game the rest of my life. So what Dave is saying, that he's done his time. No, no, no. The, the next April... My nine-year-old granddaughter signs up for soccer. <laughs> and my fat butt was sitting right there next to the field watching another soccer Aww. game. So, I, I might be in the same boat here soon because my, my kids, four of my children, are actually uh, participating once a week in a soccer thing that uh, Fran Hammond put us on to that's over at Sp Spring Mills High School. And oh, she's a great soccer My oldest son loved it. So Yeah, learn what offside is. It's offside. I just want it's not him to offsides. learn. To, it's offside, right? I want him to learn to kick very well, so he can maybe become like Chris Scaglione, which was a guy I played football with at, at Shepherd, <laughs> who was an awesome soccer player. And Joe Gibbs went and recruited him to play at Oakton High School to, just to kick. And Chris Scaglione, they ran it at the time. They ran uh, Oakton ran the offense of the Washington Redskins, and Joe Gibbs' son was playing there. It was a quarterback, or one of them was a linebacker. And Chris Scaglione played what. Art Monk, the position Art Monk played, and he had 50-some catches, and he went 9-1 and came to Shepard. But I want my kid to learn to kick because the best position in the NFL you can have is kicker. You get paid well, <laughs> and most of the time you don't take a beat. I think, like it's, the, I think it's, the, by the way, you don't ever want to be the one dad in the stands saying, what's offside? Okay, you just don't, you don't want to be that guy. You don't, you don't want to be that guy. I guarantee you, you don't want to be that guy. But... I think it's the second best position in football, long snapper. That's the best position. Yeah, well, you get beat up pretty yeah. good a long snapper. Those guys, and Jamie Weller did it for four years. That was his only thing he did it. Sure. Yeah, there's, was there, long there are rarity. And I was a holder for that, all that stuff. Well, all that, imp uh, that impeachment talk may have inspired a phone call. Judy is on the Berkeley and Jefferson County Medical Center. WVU Medicine Talk Line. Judy, how are you this morning? I'm doing great. You guys sound like you're pretty well charged up too. Yeah, I, I talked um, to your I talked to your husband last night uh, for about an hour. It's nice. Oh wow, yeah. that's why I couldn't find him. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I have a question. I guess Mike or Jason or both would have some comment on this. I noticed that our governor once again is you know using his big lips but has appointed a blue ribbon commission. My question as a taxpayer is, is there a cost associated with that? And my second um, question is, I remember reading when this man was elected as our governor that he would relinquish the management of the Greenbrier to, I guess it's his daughter uh, and his resident manager. But um, in his uh, state press release, he personally took responsibility for signing on a gaming um, uh, company. And if he's not, according to our West Virginia law, supposed to be managing the Greenbrier, and now he's touting off that he brought this company in so he can be the first in the state with um, the betting, sport mm -hmm. betting. So I'm just a little confused how he's rewritten the book of what he can and can't do. And um, and if you could straighten me out on some of those issues, I'd be grateful. Well, I'll start with the HEPC. The HEPC Blue Ribbon uh, Commission for Higher Education is, uh, I think it's... Quite frankly, it's set up to do get the desired result that they wanted beforehand that they realized that they couldn't do legally. 
And I think it's uh, a pro very problematic in my mind. And as far as the cost goes, the people from the legislature, I'm sure, will get a per diem and mileage to go to any meetings. And the other uh, people, for instance, anybody that's elected or already a paid public employee will, will not get additional pay for it, I'm, I'm assuming. They will get mileage if they have to travel. But mm -hmm. so there is a cost to it. Now, whether it's it's not a ten or twenty thousand dollars a day or thirty thousand dollars a day like the legislature, but there is a there is a cost. And I, I believe it's being set up just to all you have to do is my, my understanding is going to be a meeting next week and, and uh, we'll see what happens. This is with the HEPC, not with them. They have not set up any meeting times, but I'm not I'm not very optimistic about what this uh, HEPC is going to come, this uh, Blue Ribbon Commission is going to come up with. And as far as justice, I haven't read that, that he actually bragged about that. But if he did, there's just another uh, thing you can add to the articles. Well, Judy, I think that you bring, impeachment. Up, you bring up a good point with the governor because he did say that very clearly that, that his daughter uh, was going to run uh, the Greenbrier. Um, and one of the things about sports betting is the integrity fee. And, and 134 legislators were opposed to it. Uh, after the bill was, was signed, um, the governor was... was uh, very interested in bringing us back into special session to implement an integrity fee uh, because that's what the leagues wanted. And, and as you know, the, the PGA uh, has a golf tournament at the Greenbrier. I just had it last weekend. Uh, the Houston Texans oh, it's have going it. on right now. Mm -hmm. Oh, is it? Yeah, yeah it's still going on. Yeah, yeah. Well, there was so much I'm paying yeah. attention to it. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, Bubba, but, Bubba was a, under under 200 par yesterday. But the Houston Texans, um, they have their training their training camp uh, there. So obviously there was a, there's a vested interest for him to be on the side of the leagues, and so for him to to really want that integrity fee. Um, you know, I think really bring, uh, brings up some questions, and um, you know, I think Mike's right. This is just a, a, another uh, add one more thing to the list of of things that the governor shouldn't be doing. And I'll just add to that. You sure it's the Texans? I thought it was the Saints. No, it was, it no, was it, the it, Saints. It, now it's the Texans. Oh, they switched the it. I'm behind times on, on the NFL, too. I'm watching he switches play. teams, too? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that's obvious, right? <laughs> Judy, Judy, did you get your question answered? Yes, I did, and it just reconfirms me, uh, for me that uh, our governor, who, you know, up front uh, during election time, sounded like he might be able to do the job, and um, and now it's all about um, uh, who do I want to kiss and who wants to kiss me, and I find that really revolting as a taxpayer in West Virginia. So Great. I know you guys will get down there and um, get to the bottom of it, and I thank you very much. And when you want to get good answers, you come to the public affairs firm of Barrett, Folk, and Brown, right? To, uh, <laughs> 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 I don't know if I, that would be an interesting office say. environment, I would, uh, I would expect. We're talking about a lot of different issues today, kind of focused on who should go. What did you say, Sammy, The uh, who's, who's getting fired? Uh, yeah, uh, no. The theme that we're having today. Yeah. Yeah. Who goes and who Who's stays? Who's fired today? Well, I think there's, there's also the top three, I think, in commerce now. I don't know if they're re rehiring anybody or not. But the one thing, I, uh, again, I'll reiterate, the, it's about the sports betting thing. The, the guy that was in the, the offices lobbying everybody and bringing in the NBA people and all that stuff, a common name, Larry Puccio. One of the things that fascinates me about all of this is how does this play out here at home in Morgan, Jefferson, and Berkeley counties? How will that play out in state senate races and state delegate races? And among the races that interest me the most are the ones are the open seats because those are the ones without uh, the you know the incumbent advantage, if you will. And one of those is in the 59th district in the seat that Sarah Blair is vacating. Uh, Larry Comp the Republican nominee in a hard-fought uh, uh, battle against um, the uh, Tally uh, Reed. I get the two tallies uh, mixed up sometimes. Tally Reed, uh, he is the Republican nominee and a pretty close vote on the Republican side. And John Eisner, who is a young guy, uh, recently graduated from WVU Medical School, law, uh, uh, law school, I'm mm -hmm. sorry, and now uh, over at Shepherd University running the debate team. Uh, that is a, a race that I think uh, could be interesting, but it does really favor the Republicans. So the question I put out here, what does John Eister need to do to make that a competitive seat, and is that even possible? Jason, thoughts on that? Well, I think he had a really good interview yesterday. I uh, do, too. He was really uh, nice to have. Yeah, I, I thought that he, he's able to talk about issues. I think he's able to relate 
uh, to people, uh, and I think that's that's where it's going to come down. You know, for so long in the Eastern Panhandle, specifically in Berkeley County, that um, a lot of these these legislative races are over before they get started because of the makeup of the district and because of kind of the national mood of politics. That the Democrat was just, you know, a generic Republican has a 15 point advantage uh, before any votes cast, and and, and that's a, a huge hurdle to overcome. Um, if Democrats are going to be successful in some of these more conservative districts, I think that you know. It, it, it's going to require a centrist Democrat. It's going to require uh, that person to go out and, and meet voters. Uh, and not Which he is doing a lot of. He's canvassing Absolutely. the neighborhoods like crazy yeah, there. That's, that's incredibly important. It's, it's very hard to do in a very rural district like that. Especially but, when it's 100 degrees out. Well, but I think that shows a commitment to voters that if you're willing to come out here in the 100 degree heat and talk about issues on their doorstep, that, that you're going to go do a good job if you're elected. So so I think he's doing that. And also the, the national mood has to change or... The, the national influence is, I guess, a better way of putting it, has to change that, that, that we have to get back uh, to voters choosing um, based on individual candidates. And I'm not saying all voters don't do that, but but because of the, 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 the national mood recently uh, in this anti-democratic movement, because of what the National Democratic Party has made this hard turn to the left, uh, has made it very hard for West Virginia Democrats. And I think one of the things that you always, that I try to distinguish is that uh, there is a difference between a West Virginia Democrat and, and National Democrat. And, and I think in districts like that, you know, I think that you you have to you have to be a centrist and you have to you know be understanding of of, of some issues uh, whether it be gun rights or things like that uh, that you have to be open to and i think that's that's some of the things that he's doing mike any thoughts on that at all on that district you probably know that district pretty well well i think jason hit it right i mean it's, 50, it's overwhelmingly a republican district and uh, the only way john eisner wins that is if he acts like a republican oh, but, uh, which no. which <laughs> Uh, and when I when I say act like so, he's got a when he's doing a campaign. He talked about. I'll give you one example. I listened to part of his. That's a strategy interview. that never works, by the way. It, Thank uh, you. No, no. But let me tell you what he said yesterday when he talked about the health care, the PEIA. He mentioned that we needed competition. He was referring to competition for insurance, but I think you need competition in the health care providers. He did sound a little Republicanish on that. That's issue. what I'm saying. He said right. you needed competition. Which, if you ask him about the big picture health care, I bet he's for. The Affordable Care Act, this even is, though it polls like about eighty-four percent against it in the state of West Virginia. This is an old, uh, this is an old Democratic candidate trick that has been used for a long time. You'll take a, basically a liberal, uh, you know, progressive Democrat in the way that he or she votes, and then they'll pick out an issue such as Second Amendment. And they'll buy a gun and they'll go out and they'll get video of them hunting and shooting at targets and whatever. But Joe Manchin, 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 Manchin wasn't the first to do that. And what that allows them to do is to go be the liberal they want to be on the Senate floor of the House. I'm really speaking about federal more than legislative here. But it allows them to say, "What? you can't call me a liberal. I'm an NRA member. I mean, I own an arsenal of guns at home. I'm just like you. And it allows conservatives to say, ah, well, he might be liberal on some issues, but, you know, he's, well, a, it's, gun, it's he's a gun guy. It's increasingly hard to do that because of all the transparency and the voting records and, and, and all that in the social media and all that comes up in, in front of everybody's face. You know, when you're talking about it in the past, you know, there wasn't this constant 24-7 coverage of what was going on, whether it be the legislature or or in Congress. So it, it's harder for, uh, and that's on both sides, uh, it's harder for them to kind of mask who they really are anymore. I mean, do I have to be the idealist in this conversation? You might have to be, Sam. That's say, why we brought you in today. Where I say John Eisner, be your most authentic self. <laughs> like well, what, whatever it is that you believe in. Well, he in. might be being his most well, authentic exactly, self. He seems I, like an authentic guy to and me. He, and he's he very is. Personable. He's a good man, mm -hmm. for one. And also, he is very... He has a, a very intuitive way in how he speaks He's the kind of guy that I would invite over to my backyard you for a cookout it. and have a few beers with. Well, and I think that's that, the kind that of that guy he is. that doesn't make him, he doesn't need to be a quote-unquote centrist. He doesn't need to be more Republican. He doesn't have to out-Republican the Republican. But Jason's got a good point. He can't go out there and be Nancy Pelosi or Chuck well, Schumer I'm either. not going to be Chuck Schumer either. I think the point, what, the point that <laughs> I was making. good to know, by the way, Sammy. <laughs> the point that I was making is that we have to have more centrist Democrats. We right. have in West Virginia. We don't need people to go act like a centrist. We need to people actually be centrist and that was a point that i'm making and i think that's where he is i, I think that that he was 100 percent genuine i wasn't suggesting that he's acting like a centrist in order to get votes i think that's 
I think that's where he's this at. Is a, this is a district that has been represented, and I would argue quite ably, by Sarah Blair the past four years. There's no doubt where she's coming from on the ideological scale. She's a bona fide conservative, sure. I think, in, in every way. I think that Larry Kump, who had the seat for four years before she did, tried to win it back. Now, same thing. This is a seat that has been consistently, reliably red Republican district. It's a district that went for uh, Trump in a big way, and will probably go for Morrissey, if I had to to predict. Eisner needs to figure out a way. I think that's what we're all saying. He needs to figure out a way in his messaging to get Trump slash Republican, reliable Republican voters to come back over on his side. He has to give them a reason. And, and I'm not sure that just being a good guy and talking to them at the doorstep is enough. Maybe it is. Uh, well, not not necessarily, but you can be a populist without being a centrist. And I think folks need to recognize that Trump isn't a conservative. Trump is anti-left. Trump was populist. I absolutely agree with that. I, what she just said, I agree with. Well, what I said about the Eisner race was, was based on what he said yesterday, and then I've seen some of his advertising, you know, sponsored posts on social media, and, you know, there were literally kind of conservative free market type principles over here, but then he had all of his endorsements over here, and that was the, tru that was the truth over here. <laughs> and those, free, those endorsements weren't the ones that typically Republicans get. Well, I mean, you're talking about teachers and mine workers, and, you know, I've, I mean, I get their endorsements, too. That doesn't mean I'm against free market principles. I'm, I'm, I'm for interesting, exciting, close campaigns. That's what I like to have. I believe in a two-party system. And even as a Republican, I'll go out on a limb and say this. I'm not sure it's so good for the state of West Virginia to have such a lopsided number in the state house of delegates. I'm not saying I want the Democrats to take over. I'm not, I'm not advocating that. So don't go crazy out there on me, everyone. I'm just saying that I would like to see. I think we have better government when it's a closer ratio. And we we actually, we actually, at least I thought it would be uh, a closer mix last election, and, and, it, and it wasn't. And I think this time, um, and even most of the Democrats I've talked to, they don't think they'll take the majority, but they think they'll get a closer mix. And, and I, I think you're, I like your state. I agree with your statement. Matt, let's take a break now. I'm going to come back and explore that uh, before we close, because that's an interesting topic to close on today, which is the, the whole topic of what's different this year than it might have been two years ago. You're listening to Eastern Panhandle Talk with Rob and Dave. Matt, in for Rob. Stay with us. We'll be right back to close things up. celebration event at Miller's Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram in Martinsburg. Stop in now for great deals on a great line of Jeep products. Get $1,000 cash back on a 2019 Jeep Cherokee with financing at 0% for 60 months. How about a new 2019 Cherokee Latitude 4x4, only $219 a month. Or a 2018 Jeep Wrangler JK for only $296 a month. Get bonus cash up to $6 thousand dollars off a 2018 renegade plus 500 dollar trade stop by and test drive a chrysler pacifica and get free movie passes it's all at the jeep celebration event at miller's chrysler dodge jeep ram home of the lifetime powertrain warranty on kelly island road or online at miller's chrysler jeep.com all payments based on approved credit taxes tax and processing fees extra see dealer for details the future doesn't wait. Why should you? Blue Ridge Community and Technical College offers over 50 degree and certificate programs in education, IT, culinary arts, engineering, and so much more. Small class sizes, flexible schedules with evening and online classes with affordable tuition, plus financial aid is available to those who qualify. Now you can go to college. Visit us online at blueridgectc.edu. That's blueridgectc.edu. Stop waiting and enroll today. The Wellness Center at Berkeley Medical Center introduces a healthy way of life. It's not just another diet, but a weight management program developed by the Wellness Center that includes metabolic testing, a simple 10-minute breathing test that determines how many calories your body actually needs, followed by working one-on-one -on -one with a health coach to develop a personalized mix of exercise and nutrition to tip the scales in your favor towards successful weight loss. A lifetime of good health awaits at the Wellness Center. For more info, call 304-264-1232. 
Are you looking for a full-service web design company right here in the Eastern Panhandle? Then look no further than Pro Design LLC, specializing in web design and development, web hosting and application development. Pro Design is a locally owned company serving local clients since 1997 with a reputation of quality, creativity, and personal touch. Let Pro Design build or redesign your dream website. Find them online at professionaldesign.com or phone 304-676-9940. Welcome back into the program, everyone. We are doing what we do on Fridays, which is kind of a lot of fun. We gather people around the table who are involved in politics, Matt, uh, at one level or another. And uh, we opine and uh, we debate a little bit, but hopefully have a good, robust uh, discussion, as we have been having today. Okay, here's the question in uh, about two-and-a-half-minute lightning round. Uh, I'll start with Sammy. I'll go to, uh, to Mike and then to Jason. I'm interested in your thoughts. What's different about 2018? than it was in 2016 as it relates to the state legislature, which is now pretty lopsided on the Republican side. Do we see changes this year and why, Sammy? You absolutely will see change this year. Just selfishly speaking, you will see change this and year. And tell me why. Give me a reason for that. Is it because, is it because the, the, the Trump wave isn't there? I mean, I think you did have a lot of energy at the top of the ticket, which dictated down ballot. But I will also say that this particular year is a year that folks are already engaged, that they've been watching, that they have really invested in their legislature. Michael Folk, you're, what do you think about uh, this year? What's different and uh, what will change? Well, of course, we're going in a good direction as far as budgetary-wise in the state. But the biggest difference structurally is that how many people, how many seats are actually open in the House. And Jason and I were talking about this during break. I think there's, he said, three on the Democrat side did, did not seek re-election. There's 15 or more. On the Republican side, including, 15 including, members of the House in, not seeking re-election. That's a lot. Including, uh, and I don't know if he included in this in the number, but we've had several people that that uh, resigned and have been replaced with people that have literally been there only for a special session, for instance. And and then on the Senate side, the thing that's interesting is that this is the first election after. Uh, after the Republicans took control. So all the people that got in the wave of 2014 are up for re-election now. Last word, Jason well, Barry. Uh, you know, there's a speaker's race. I think that plays into yes, it. Yes, that's what I'm Mike brings up good points that the number of Republicans not seeking re-election in the House. Um, I, I think that uh, the teacher strike uh, will come back big in November. So, so the Republicans have some negatives now that they haven't had in the past. Good discussion, Matt. Uh, any last word at all on this? It's been fun. I've just yeah. enjoyed sitting back and listening to the conversation. And it's been great to work with you for these two days. Rob Mario will be back, rumor has it, on Monday morning. So we'll be back to Eastern Panhandle Talk with Rob and Dave. Matt, thank you so much. Uh, you for, did good, Matt. For, you, you did, did good. good. <laughs> he always does good. He's the one and only Matt Miller. Jason Barrett, Mike Folk, and Sammy Brown, thank you so much for joining us. We will for sure have you back another time. You're listening to Eastern Panhandle Talk with Rob and Dave here on WRNR Martinsburg. Stay tuned. Glenn Beck is next. This is CBS News on the Hour, sponsored by TheraWorks Relief. I'm Deborah Rodriguez. The U.S.-China trade conflict escalates as the Trump administration makes a move at a minute past midnight, imposing 25% tariffs on Chinese imports. Beijing retaliated just hours later. Business analyst Jill Schlesinger. The impact on the world economy is probably small at this point. Both the U.S. and Chinese economies are predominantly domestically focused. For now, economist Peter Morisi says... American farmers are going to be hit hard. This is going to be disruptive to the economy, but not in the way that you might think. You're not going to run out to the Walmart and see the price of a toaster go up by 25%. Russia announced today it is imposing new tariffs on U.S. products. The economy added 213,000 jobs last month. Unemployment ticked up to 4%. PNC chief economist Gus Fauche. The reason that the unemployment rate went up is that we had an extra 600,000 people looking for work in June. So we saw more people interested in joining the labor market. That's good news. That means that people are excited about the way the economy is moving forward. Wages stayed about the same. With monsoon rains on the way for the weekend, the race to rescue 12 boys and their soccer coach from a cave in Thailand takes on new urgency. Reporter Sophie Long. The only way out is the way that they came in, but that is 
still flooded with water and as demonstrated by the sad death of a former Thai Navy SEAL last night, just shows just how dangerous it would be if they do decide to take that route. The Navy SEAL died when he ran out of oxygen, placing canisters of CO2, that is, along the boy's potential exit route. President Trump is narrowing down his list of choices to replace retiring Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy. Correspondent Major Garrett. We were told the president has confined his list down to three. Raymond Kesslidge, Amy Coney Barrett and Brett Kavanaugh, all sitting on federal appeals court. There are various factions in favor of all three. The president said he'll make his decision on Sunday, announce it to the country on Monday evening here at the White House. A mother and child reunion in Chicago. I'm relieved to have my son in my hands now. A Brazilian woman threw an interpreter after being reunited with her 10-year-old son. The administration is under court order to release all children five and under. That's about 100 of them to their parents by Tuesday and thousands of others by the end of the month. B is for Beryl, the first hurricane of the season that's formed in the Atlantic. The National Hurricane Center expects it'll dump wind and rain on the Lesser Antilles then peter out. And Elvis Costello has announced he's canceling the rest of his European tour after undergoing surgery for an aggressive form of cancer. Dow is